It is a revolutionary world that we all live in. And thus, as I have said, in Latin America and in Asia and in Europe and in my own country, the United States, it is the young people who must take the lead. Thus, you and your young compatriots everywhere have had thrust upon you a greater burden of responsibility than any generation that has ever lived. There is, said an Italian philosopher, nothing more difficult to take in hand, more perilous to conduct, or more uncertain in its success than to take the lead in the introduction of a new order of things. Yet this is the measure of the task of your generation, and the road is strewn with many dangers. First is the danger of futility, the belief there is nothing one man or one woman can do against the enormous array of the world's ill, against misery, against ignorance, or injustice and violence. Yet many of the world's great movements of thought and action have flowed from the work of a single man. A young monk began the Protestant Reformation. A young general extended an empire from Macedonia to the borders of the earth, and a young woman reclaimed the territory of France. It was a young Italian explorer who discovered the new world, and 32-year-old Thomas Jefferson, who proclaimed that all men are created equal. Give me a place to stand, said Archimedes, and I will move the world. These men move the world, and so can we all. Few will have the greatness to bend history, but each of us to work to change a small portion of the event, and then the total, all of these acts will be written in the history of this generation. I welcome this kind of examination. I am paying for this microphone. What difference does it make? I'm as mad as hell, and I'm not going to take this anymore. I'm just a patsy. Not a Pax Americana, enforced on the world. By American weapons of war. Wherever there's a cop beating up a guy, I'll be there. We didn't land on Plymouth Rock. The rock was landed on us. The United States is owned by foreign corporations. Do you really care? And if anybody cares, they're considered crazy. I have sinned against you, my lord. Holy man, all the humanity and all the... The controller's here looking very carefully at the situation. Obviously a major malfunction. An unspeakable tragedy. Dead on arrival. And I will go to my grave being at peace about it. Our long national nightmare is over. Don't give up. Don't ever give up. This is the Midnight Rider News Show with S.T. Patrick. Hi, this is Jeff Worcester from the Center for Deep Political Research. You're listening to the Midnight Rider News Show with S.T. Patrick. Hello, America and the world. Welcome to the Midnight Rider News Show. I'm S.T. Patrick, your friendly neighborhood host, traipsing through the trials and travails that have so tempestuously and untruthfully been blasted into your eyes, ears, and minds by the state-sponsored talking heads, the court historians, and the textbook conglomerates that control information today. Tonight, we have episode 069, Richard Bartholomew and the Gordian Knot. Our guest tonight is researcher Richard Bartholomew, and he'll join us next in the Midnight Hour. Now, first, a little cleaning of the castle. The Midnight Rider t-shirts will soon be available, and you'll be able to order in a multitude of sizes and colors. Now, we're not making a lot off of these, and we're going to try to price them reasonably. But as I said before, we see these sorts of things as donations more than purchases. So we're asking you to help Midnight Rider News in exchange for a really sharp t-shirt. I love these shirts, and I think that you will too. So for those who haven't seen them, they'll be on our Facebook page again. That's at Midnight Rider News Show on Facebook. And if you'd like to email us with questions or if you just want the pictures through email, I can send you those. And you can contact me directly at MidnightRiderNews at gmail.com. And we'll be right back with Richard Bartholomew. Who were the first researchers out of the box to question the Warren Commission's version of the JFK assassination? What obstacles did they have to face? How did their research find them and inspire their work to this day? And just what did Randy Benson buy at the last Hurrah bookstore? You won't believe it. This is Randy Benson, director, producer, and writer of the documentary film The Searchers. To hear more about The Searchers, listen to Episode 9 of the Midnight Writer News Show.
Richard Bartholomew is an editorial cartoonist. His talent, education, training, and professional experience have been primarily in the visual arts. His historiography and criminal investigations of the JFK assassination were initially motivated by a civic duty to report a suspicious automobile fitting the description of a getaway car seen by several witnesses leaving Dealey Plaza in his hometown of Dallas. Now, Bartholomew's investigative work has been more in the tradition of, say, a self-taught Sherlock Holmes than a professional Inspector Lestrade. His research of the JFK assassination includes his discovery of a 1959 Rambler station wagon possibly used in the conspiracy. A study co-authored with Walter F. Graff involving a rifle clip that contaminates the ballistic evidence, a chronological reconstruction and placement of missing movements edited out of the Zapruder film, an in-depth interview of Erwin Schwartz with author Noel Twyman regarding Mr. Schwartz and Mr. Zapruder's early chain of possession of Zapruder film, and work for author Barr McClellan resulting in Bartholomew's monograph establishing the methods by which the FBI and the Warren Commission concealed and obfuscated latent fingerprints from the alleged sniper's nest. Yes, that's the school book depository. Now, Bartholomew's research has been presented at scholarly conferences and published in books and journals on the JFK assassination. Now, in two decades, his findings have had no serious negative criticism in a field rife with such. And you know how rife that is if you've heard a few of our other episodes. Now, I should also say that Bartholomew is the co-founder of the Center for Deep Political Research, which is at cdpresearch.org. He's my colleague there, and he's becoming a good friend. So... Here he is, Richard Bartholomew. How are you tonight, Richard? I'm doing well, ST. How are you doing? I am well, and it's a pleasure to have you on tonight. Now, you've really written some strong material, much of which is about to be published in book form. More on that later. And you were one of the highlights of that 2016 conference in Dallas that I talk about on the show quite often. But I really want to start with your own personal story, because you've written an essay entitled My Small World JFK. And I was affected by it because I think that most people, most outsiders at least, think that this whole JFK assassination thing is a weird sort of hobby for most people that are involved in researching the case. Yet your essay showed that for you and for many, I'm assuming, this is deeply personal. So if you would, take us through the ways in which the JFK assassination and Dallas and Dealey Plaza really affects your life and always has. Well, yeah, that's one of the new essays that will be in a book of mine that will compile my uh, 25 years of writing on the JFK assassination. Don't have an exact idea when that will be out, but uh, my friend Joe Green at uh, Say Something Real Press um, is working hard on it, and it's probably pretty close to publication. It'll be available on Amazon and uh, as a um, paper and as a um, uh, ebook. So, uh, and so nobody's read that uh, except for our small group um, at the Center for Deep Political Research, our core founders, who've been in deep discussions about all of this for a couple of years now. At one point, um, we got this idea to write up these bios of ourselves just to have handy and share them with each other. And um, that was the inception of that essay. I'd never written down most of that. It's just stuff I'd talked about for years. And the same was true of the others. And they were all fascinating uh, to read their bios as well. I call it my small world of uh, JFK assassination conspiracy because I was born in Dallas in South Oak Cliff in 1956. Uh, Now, this was years before Oswald showed up, but I was living only about a mile from uh, 1026 North Beckley. I was even closer. I was only about, you know, five or six blocks from a safe house, a CIA safe house that was used by Operation 40 in the week leading up to the assassination itself. Uh, Those who know this research I guess we're spe- your your audience is pretty sophisticated, so they are. Yes, uh, that's good because we don't have time to go over who Operation Forty was and in any detail. But they were they were basically a group of trained assassins who were ostensibly uh, trained to kill Castro, but uh, you know 
there 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 is the idea in the research that that team was turned and used to kill Kennedy. Well, there they were, a few blocks from where I was a baby in South Oak Cliff. Uh, well, you know, they were there eventually. Uh, I don't know the history of the safe house prior to that, but they were there in 63. And But I was gone from South Oak Cliff by 63. Um, but I still, you know, I grew up there, and uh, I was um, four years old when we moved to Mesquite. And those of us who've read the um, 26 volumes have come across many, many names and addresses who lived in Mesquite, witnesses, suspects, the whole nine yards. And so I knew that area as well, that geography, and those people. And um, I grew up with them. I bonded with them. I bonded with those streets and those houses. And so at the time of the assassination, I was living in Mesquite, and I was only 13 miles um, from Dealey Plaza. I was in my second grade classroom, and uh, I have a similar story to um, those who were my age at the time, seven. And, uh, you know, except that <laughs> my principal, principal of our school, a woman, I don't recall her name, but uh, this is, now I'm going into my flash memory now. Uh, the memories, the memories that, that never left me from that moment. Um, she, she got on the PA. Um, it was after lunch. We had had lunch already. Uh, we were back in the classroom where normally we had story time. The teacher would read stories and I would draw pictures. Uh, that's how I became an artist eventually. I was a prodigy back then, and I was actually discovered as a prodigy by that second-grade teacher, Mrs. Price. And this was at Ty Singer Elementary School in Mesquite. And um, so we were probably in story time. I don't remember that exactly, but uh, the principal comes on at an unusual time and announces that uh, she had just returned from watching the motorcade watching the parade. And she was sorry to report that uh, the president had been shot and um, she was dismissing school. Um, he may have already been dead. She may have already pronounced that he had died uh, because, uh, and many had the same recollection, the same memory, that their teachers started crying or the people they were with, their parents or whoever, the adults started crying. Mrs. Price did. Um, she just sat there and, and weeped lightly as she motioned us out of the classroom. Um, fortunately, I was only a couple of blocks from uh, home. was used to walking to and from class. So I caught up with my older brother, who was a grade ahead of me, and we started walking our little block path. But just as we crossed the street from the campus... My mom drives up in our family car, pulls over to the curb where we're walking, and she's, get in the car. I will not have you walking the streets when we haven't got a president. And that's a very strong memory of mine. And it comes from, you know, a lot of people's memories of how upset the adults were. You know, we didn't know what was going on. But we, as all kids do, we sensed, we we. We picked up our emotional life from the adults around us. And um, so then it was just home and TV and um, cold, crisp weekend in Dallas and just glued to the TV and to the funeral. Um, and um, so after that, uh, looking back on it, it took me years. It was really only maybe 10, 15 years ago that it dawned on me that um, how much this affected me. Uh, maybe it was right in the middle. So it was about 20 years ago that I was right in the middle of all, all of the heavy research I was doing on the assassination. And, um, and I was being introspective about, you know, uh, my interest in it, you have to be because you're, you become marginalized uh, 
among friends and family and everyone. And so you become introspective. You, you wonder, you know, is this worthy of, of my time and effort? And you have to resolve that in your own mind. In fact, I tell a lot of people, there's a, early on when you start your reading on this subject in your, in your didactic education on it, because they will not teach you this in any school, at least in most places there are those exceptions. But most of us are autodidacts, and we were self-taught on this. And fortunately, those of us who were educated, formally educated, knew how to do that. And, um, but you're still learning something that you had never been taught and that you were actually um, prevented from, te from learning. And you were still um, uh, criticized for even learning it on your own. So, uh, and there's a paranoid phase you go through in the beginning. And I see, I've seen that over and over with a lot of other new researchers. Um, and I use the word paranoid in the vernacular, in the common sense, because it is a clinical term. And I advise people not to use it once you get into, once you are identified as a JFK researcher. I, I, we still like to casually say, oh, I was paranoid about this, or I'm paranoid about that. I'm trying to get people to not do that, when, especially in our um, endeavors uh, where we're trying to start a think tank, the Center for Deep Political Research. Because words matter and phrases matter, and this is a clinical term which has been used by the propagandists to paint us as nuts. It's a clinical term for irrationality, irrational fear. Uh, and it doesn't apply here uh, to those who are saying serious researchers uh, because uh, we come across uh, a threat here that is a rational fear. And um, that builds, and at some point early on in your research, you either overcome that fear or you learn to live with it in order to keep going. The ones who kept going had to deal with that fear. Um, and and deal with it daily thereafter. And not deny it, but just control it the way you control all the, the fear in your life. And um, so, um, but looking back, back to my youth, 64, 65, 66, uh, everything eventually got back to semi-normal. Um, and, but looking back, I didn't, after that, I no longer, first of all, I'll tell you that that teacher who, who discovered my talent in art, she um, spoke with my parents and told them that I had the talent and that I should be um, educated in art. Um, so I knew, and, and I was all for it, uh, I knew I was going to grow up to be an artist. But then you still, as a kid, you say, uh, you play fireman, you play army, you play cop and robber. Uh, but I didn't want to be um, a fireman. I didn't want to be a cowboy. Uh, I wanted to be, get this, a secret service agent. It, it was fairly normal at this time because the whole um, pop culture spy craze had started by then, with the James Bond series. And and on TV too, everything, all everything that was a western that became a cop show was now some sort of a secret agent spy show. And I had my favorites, actually, you know. And Oswald, Lee Harvey Oswald had one like that. That was his favorite. That was uh, I led three lives about an actual guy named I um, uh, can't remember the name now, but uh, an actual FBI double agent who had infiltrated the Communist Party. That was Lee Harvey Oswald's favorite show when he was a pre-teen and early teen. And it says a lot about him, uh, those who research his, his biography. Um, but, you know, so uh, I wanted to be, a, and I told people, I, 
what do you want to be? I want to be a secret service agent so I can protect the president. So you see, looking back now on that, I saw where it was all leading. The Kennedy assassination, I realized, was the defining moment of my life. Um, even though it was not uh, something um, that I pursued consciously um, as a kid, uh, it was all around us. People talked about it. I can tell you that that first weekend, the adults around me uh, were already saying, uh, there's no way this happened the way they're saying it did. It, and those in Texas, you'll find this is a common story, people with these memories. Uh, anybody that was a Texan, and a long-time Texan, their immediate thought was, LBJ had something to do with this. Uh, you know, we were not blind to Lyndon Johnson. Uh, in fact, I, I grew up despising him. Kennedy, on the other hand, was, um, was a father figure at the age of four, five, six, and seven. I'm bonding in that way, uh, parental figures and authority figures. And Kennedy was the first president that I actually knew. I was born under Eisenhower, but I never was aware. I was too young to be aware of actual uh, Eisenhower doings and speakings. And so Kennedy was the first president I was aware of. And, of course, what a great guy to uh, have as your first president that you know. Um, and everybody, you know, the Kennedys were superstar celebrities. That, never, that has not happened again. <clears throat> uh, of course, they're celebrities. They're famous. Uh, but not superstar celebrities in the positive sense that the Kennedys were. Our current president, you could call him a superstar celebrity, which he was before he became president, but in, in the majority, not in a positive way. That's completely unlike the way it was with the Kennedys. And think, think of the greatest superstar celebrities in Hollywood at the time. You would always go to see their movies. You would read the, um, the tabloids about them and keep up with them and admire them and be fans of them. That is what the Kennedys were. They actually had fans. And so that plays into the sense of shock and mourning. Uh, I've read that the same was true of President Garfield uh, and other presidents who were assassinated. Lincoln, of course, you get a sense of that. But, of course, that was before the TV age, and that was before uh, this particular assassination. And that played into it as well. You know, your president is your president. And they say these were naive times. And, yeah, they were, but not as naive as people try to paint them. There were lots of people around who knew about the underworld and about the uh, the dark side of politics. It was just perhaps not as well known or discussed as it is now. Uh, but there was this sense of it. People did know that. And you can you can get a sense of it too when you go back and you look at you look at uh, the films that were being made. They would touch on this stuff. I mean this is the, the era of Frank Sinatra's Suddenly, which is about an assassination attempt on a president, the movie. And it's uh, the Manchurian candidate and you could go on and on. Uh, it, this is the era of Dr. Strangelove, uh, which was a larger, a bigger picture of the crazy politics of that time. You look at Dr. Strangelove now, and you see today's politics. Well, there it was back in 1962, three, four. And, uh, of course, we know that the Manchurian Candidate was, a, was the book by Richard Condon that Kennedy wanted made into a film and supported it uh, and did what he could to have them have access to the White House and whatever resources he could uh, lend them for that movie. Big supporter of it because he believed that what the book uh, portrayed, well, no, I'm, I'm conflating, not Manchurian Candidate, Seven Days in May was the Kennedy-supported film. Uh, but yeah, that, add that to the list, Seven Days in May, about a military coup to take over the government. And Kennedy 
even though he didn't say it publicly, he did say it privately. He supported that film because he saw it as a reality that he lived with every day. The Joint Chiefs were, you know, well, it goes on and on. We could, we could get easily get sidetracked here. But we'll go back to my personal story. Um, so, defining moment of my life, um, I, I talk about that in the essay. Um, so, by, um, let's see, so, the spy craze eventually died out, um, and I'm interested in history and in politics, and um, although I, I was going to say that I, I did not like Lyndon Johnson, so I had gone, made a drastic turn in my mind as, as a youth, um, a very, a very uh, interesting and in, intelligent and celebrity president, it changed over into a guy nobody seemed to like. A guy like we have today. Uh, when when Trump actually became president, I was as surprised as anyone else. Not not as sh- not shocked, but I was surprised. And but I would tell my close friends when we would discuss it. I would say, you know, for me this is deja vu, because this is like to me this is like LBJ. Um, and everybody uh, who gets anxiety from the possibility of nuclear war. Or even or any war, uh, the war, the ongoing wars. I tell them, you know, been there. This is nostalgia for me. Uh, it's not yet as weird as it was when I was growing up. And so that's the milieu that I grew up in. And it eventually calmed down to a certain extent when the Vietnam War ended. Um, I went through school. I grew up with the Vietnam War constantly on TV. And it's not like today. You don't see wars on TV today. You'll have the correspondents on the ground doing their own thing and showing it on the evening news every day. And even though I didn't understand what was going on, uh, I saw it. I watched it. And I had a general anxiety from it. And so I knew I was... Eventually I knew, all right, I get the drill here. I'm, I'm going to be drafted and I'm going to be sent to Vietnam, and I'm going to get shot, and I'm either going to come back wounded or dead. And uh, so I never made, I never really made any specific plans for after the age of 18. I did well, pretty well in school, pursued my art talent, and uh, had my friends and such, went to the prom, did the whole thing, had my favorite rock groups and, and pop culture stuff, Um, But in the background, you know, I knew what was going to happen. Well, so I registered for the draft my senior year in high school when I turned 18. And this was 1974, spring of 74. And um, I registered and, um, you know, waited uh, for the inevitable. Well, pretty shortly after that, within a year, the war ended. And then the draft ended. And I'm sitting here going, well, now what am I going to do? Uh, I didn't take the uh, ACT test or any of the pre-college exams. So I said, well, I guess I'll enroll in uh, community college. And I did. And it was uh, my freshman year at Richland Community College in Dallas that I was in the bookstore one day. And that I saw Sylvia Marr's book, Accessories After the Fact, on the bookshelf. It had just been reissued, 75 edition. And I, um, I grabbed it and read it, and um, it re-sparked my interest in the whole subject. Of course, now, I had been, as far back as 67, I had seen all the CBS News reports. I followed the space program. In my house, we, my mom was big on news events. She was a big news watcher. And we watched every NASA launch. It was a big event in our house. We watched every major breaking news story, and um, so and and my mom and dad were interested in the assassination, as were most people, especially those living in Dallas, of course, who were living under the stigma. That's another aspect of my life. I grew up under the stigma of living in Dallas during this time, and heard heard all of the bad things about it. And this is 
you know, this is where you live, and you kind of take it personally. So another personal aspect of the assassination, a defining moment. And um, that didn't change until the TV show Dallas gave everybody something else to talk about. Uh, but that wasn't until, that wasn't until when, the 80s? Uh, it 70. began around 78 and I think peaked around 81. Yeah, so um, that sort of like took some of the sting out. Everybody was moving on and had something else to think about Dallas for. But for me, Sylvia Marr reopened my eyes. I, like I said, I'd seen the CBS specials, the NBC specials. Oddly, though, I don't know why. I guess, you know, as a, as a kid, as a teenager, especially going through puberty and all of that angst, you, I, I feel for, for kids, and I sympathize with them, especially with history, because I feel like, you know, history is a big pill to swallow as a kid. Uh, you really don't know what history is. You haven't lived enough of it. And, and you're just being, all this stuff is being thrown at you. But it's really just an introduction. But you don't see it as an introduction at the time. But it's really just a prerequisite for you to build on later. And I'm trying to explain that to kids. Don't worry about all this history that's being thrown at you. Just absorb as much as you can. Remember as much as you can. Uh, don't get too worried about it. And you'll, it'll come around. You will go back to this as you learn more and more and get interested in more and more. And that's what it was with me. So in the late 60s, you know, I was trying to figure out life as a teenager. And there's a lot to that, too. And that's not it. That, you know, a lot of it is, it is in school, but it's not taught. Uh, it's just stuff you have to get on your own. That's why I think I was not really aware of the whole garrison thing. You know, I was hearing about it in the background and all, and all, but it wasn't, it didn't, I don't have the flash memories of it like I did the, um, the actual assassination. And, of course, that changed by the time I was in college as well. So I was reintroduced to, and I was introduced for the first time in Sylvia Moore's book to the details of the conspiracy. And there was no turning back after that. So I transferred to the University of Texas in 1976. Uh, I get through my freshman year, and then in the spring semester, uh, 77, the uh, House Select Committee on Assassinations is getting going. And Richard Sprague, the first chair of the commission, decides to go on a college speaking tour with Henry Gonzalez and Mark Lane. And by this time, I had read Lane's book as well and a couple of others. But it wasn't a regimen of reading. I had plenty of other things to read. I had to get through college after all. But I did go and attend that in an auditorium on campus. And other researchers, John Kellen has spoken about seeing them at his college campus because he and I are the same age. And, and that's where I first saw Rush to Judgment, uh, the film. And they showed that. They showed the Zapruder film, which I had... I can back up another year here. 75, I'm still in community college. <laughs> I'm going to do another anecdote about that, too. I'm still in community college, and I'm in the, um, the symphonic band. I had a whole you know, student music career that was going. At some point, I had to choose between music or art or chess because at some point, you have to devote all of your time to those talents in order to developed them, and so I had to pick one, and I picked art, of course, um, but I was doing pretty well in music and in chess as well. I was president of my high school chess club and all that. So still, in, throughout college, I was in a uh, concert band and marching band, playing brass instruments. I started with trumpet, switched to low brass, uh, mainly euphonium and baritone which I was playing in 1975 in the spring when we became the first community college band to be invited to the Music Educators National Conference in Omaha, Nebraska that year. And we're on our trip to this, and we're, we're, we've stopped. We stop at different cities along the way. We stay at people's houses, and we give concerts. And we're in Ponca City, Oklahoma. Some of us knew about the hype leading up to Geraldo Rivera's show where Robert Groden and uh, was going to be on and show the Zapruder film. There was pre-hype to that. 
And we asked the family if we could watch it. Well, not only could we watch it, they planned to watch it also. So we sat in their living room, and that's where I saw this Pruder film for the first time, March uh, 1975. And so that was in the back of my mind. And so now I'm at UT, and I'm watching it again um, in this presentation. We're hearing about the House Select Committee and what they plan to do. And we're watching Rush to Judgment. We're hearing Mark Lane speak and Richard Spray and Henry Gonzalez. At this point, you're thinking, okay, now we're getting serious. The House is, is looking into this. We're having a real investigation. Everybody was optimistic. And you relax a little bit, your anxiety is lessened, and you just leave it up to the authority figures who say they are, know what they're doing and they're going to pursue this. And, of course, you watch it and over and over again. Let me just you know, condense this now, but over and over again in the, in the later years, things start and then they end in seeming disasters like the Warren Commission did. So a lot of the acceptance that our generation had and, and the older generation had back then that younger people look at today and they, and they see, they ask themselves, how, how could they do this? Well, it's the same thing that we went through during the Vietnam War when we were saying, how could the older generation let this happen? We knew it was, uh, we may not have known the extent of the illegality of the war, but we, we heard what the protesters were saying. I was a little too young to be out protesting and a little too young for Woodstock and all that. My babysitters were in the middle of us, though, and I heard what they were saying. But we also, you know, you can say now, you can look back and say, you know, how, how could our parents have uh, accepted Pearl Harbor? And let me tell you, I've come to the realization uh, that there were people, plenty of people around at the time who questioned that, but, of course, that was investigated and buried as well. I'm talking about the pre-knowledge of, of Pearl Harbor, the, what is known as the Winds Code, um, or the East Wind Code that Japanese sent, that we had supposedly that we had deciphered, and we had knew exactly when the Japanese were telling their embassies to start burning everything that we were they were splitting with the U.S. Uh, but it goes be, it goes way beyond that. Let me just <laughs> not to get sidetracked here, but let me just insert this about Pearl Harbor. In 1938, there were uh, war games. Not not a lot of people know this. You, know, you you don't study it. In fact, I've only found a couple of people. Alan Kemp, the JFK researcher, Alan Kemp, is a friend of mine, is one who knows it maybe better than I do. But in 1938, um, the um, U.S. military held war games uh, to show off the new technology of the aircraft carrier, and um, they invited dignitaries from all over the world, and. Um, they held the, the way they just chose to show off this new technology and this new uh, aircraft ability was to put on a mock attack of Pearl Harbor. And so they staged a mock attack of Pearl Harbor in 1938. And one of the dignitaries that was invited to observe this was Admiral Yamamoto of Japan, the author of the attack on Pearl Harbor. That should tell you a lot. 1938, three years before the attack, here is Yamamoto standing in Pearl Harbor watching a mock attack by aircraft uh, from aircraft carriers. Uh, we're not taught that in school, you know. Maybe if we had, we'd start putting two and two together. But people knew this at the time, I'm sure. You know, maybe not a lot of people. There were people then who were in denial, people who didn't follow the news, but there were people who did, and people who actually followed it closely, like we began doing. And But once again, you know, they, held, they held high level investigations and all that. This has happened over and over. <laughs> so, anyway, moving on to my personal story. Uh, 1980, I'm out of college. So getting on with my... Uh, life, and Reagan is in, in power. I didn't like LBJ. I didn't like Nixon. We'd already been through Watergate. That was a whole nother anxiety. Um, 
And by this, by 1980, best evidence comes out. Okay, now we're off and running. Best evidence was a huge pop culture sensation. People don't know that now, who weren't around then. David Lifton was on TV. He was interviewed on the nightly news. He was interviewed on 60 Minutes. He was, he was, it was a, a New York Times bestseller. Everybody seemingly was reading it. Understanding it, you can question, but they were reading it. And they knew, we knew it as a pop culture story. I didn't get around to reading it until December of 81. And, uh, you know, I was out of college and trying to be in my, my career and had all that stuff going on. But I grabbed it uh, during uh, the holidays of 1981 and read it. And so now I've had a handful of books that I've read and I'm, you know, continuing my interest in it. And we can, and I, and I, you know, I meet my wife and go through marriage and all that. And so now it's 1988 and it's September and I'm working at UT and I've been at UT now for seven years as of 1988 and the University of Texas at Austin. I graduated from there and I got a job very shortly within a year or two. I got a job there and stayed there for 10 years. By September 88, you know, following politics and all that and being a good voter, uh, it dawned on me uh, that huh, George H.W. Bush was going to become our next president. It was pretty obvious by then. The polls were showing. I wasn't going to vote for him, but it was obvious to me. And so I said, and we, we knew that he had been former CIA director. But for me, having done my reading, what, what there was of it, I said, oh, my God, we're going to have our first uh, overt CIA president. Uh, and this was also, September was around the time that Joseph McBride and The Nation magazine had uncovered this Hoover memo that had named Mr. George Bush of the CIA way before he had been appointed director. This was 1963, right after the assassination. Uh, the Hoover memo was unearthed and, and publicized by The Nation magazine by Joe McBride. Uh, and... So we were, those of us who were interested in the assassination became aware of it. And, and so I'm going, uh-oh, something is up here. So I made a beeline over to Half Price Books and to the conspiracy, the conspiracy shelves and started buying and reading everything I could get my hands on and rereading, uh, not just reading, but rereading what I'd already read. And then it didn't stop from there, 1988, September. And so, uh, um, and let me tell you this, as a little side note, a little anecdote, a personal story. Uh, if you watch the movie Slacker, Richard Linklater's uh, iconic now, iconic movie about Austin in those days called Slacker, um, for those who know film, uh, and many have seen it. Well, you know about the guy, there's a character in there who's a conspiracy buff. And he's in a bookstore. And he starts bending the ear of a female customer trying to impress her with his knowledge of the JFK assassination conspiracy. And, you know, coming across as the conspiracy buff nerd, uh, which was, was the stereotype. And that guy who played that character, his name is John Slate, he was a librarian at the University of Texas. Um, and uh, that section of that very bookstore is, was where I started my library, my JFK library. Um, it looked exactly like that. I could have been, that character could have been based on me, although I didn't annoy the other customers. I just went and quietly got my stuff and checked it out and went home and read it. But uh, that's uh, you can you can watch Slacker and you can see see kind of where I was at that moment. And anyway, fast forward again to 1989. I'm still working at UT, and something that I've probably seen you know a dozen times before. Walking to lunch one day, 
but now it had a new relevance to me. And if you know anything about neurology, you know that everything about the brain is about relevance, um, about what you pay attention to is about relevance. Uh, you know, you learn a new word and suddenly you see it everywhere. Well, it had always been everywhere. You're just now relevant to you. Well, for me, that happened with a 1959 Rambler station wagon. And that began my hardcore research and writing and further reading. And it didn't stop from there for another 10 years. Uh, we're talking very serious uh, scholarly research on a daily basis and interacting with the research community. So that's sort of like a good stopping point from a personal story and the beginnings of my research story. Well, like you, Richard, there are a lot of young people out there who are in college today, and they're starting to get that spark. You and I know that spark very well. Right. And they're starting to feel that what they're being taught may not be accurate. Now, I'm assuming that you've had young people asking you for a good first book on the case. So because you are so well-read on the JFK assassination, what would be, say, three to five works that you would point them to as a good starting point? You know, I, I have had that, and I do have it. And with my book coming out, I expect to have more of it. Um, but I interact with uh, young people a lot, and um, I have a routine down. I was going to tell you earlier that after, after you know, at first it was Jim Mars' um, Crossfire. That became the first compendium. Uh, I had to read at least maybe 20 books, 25 books, to even get a sense of what was in that one book. And so I would tell people after that came out, I'd say, okay, now it's, it's easy. You don't, have to, you don't have to scrounge up all these old books and read dozens of them. You can, you can read Jim Moore's book. And then, very quickly on the heels of that, Oliver Stone's JFK came out. And with that came the book of the film, which a lot of people may not know about. It's called JFK, the book of the film, and you won't find it in the conspiracy book section. You'll find it in the film section. So I bought that, and um, I told people after that, I said, uh, all right, so go and get, go and watch JFK. At that time, it was a videotape. I still say that today. I still think this is the best regimen uh, for absolute newcomers who, who really don't have a prerequisite for any of this. You know, the easy route, go watch JFK. You're not going to understand all of it. I know people who have watched it over and over. I, watched, I, saw, I saw people who watched it, you know, 20, 50 times. Because, and for them, they were going about it wrong. They were trying to memorize the details from the movie itself, which I don't think is possible. You can memorize the movie and the dialogue but you and some of the details, but... That's the wrong way to go about it. So I'll tell them, all right, watch the movie. If you're still interested or if you're curious about some aspect, go get the book of the film. It's the annotated script, first half of the book, the annotated script of the movie. tells you the sources for every scene and every fact in the movie. You can then go from there and further read what you're interested in. You can also read the second half of the book, which shows you the, how rapidly the media went after Oliver Stone in this film before it was released. Uh, a copy of, the, of a first draft of the script, or an early draft of the script, had been leaked to the press. And the press went after Oliver Stone after that. And that's the story of that. And that, that's a very revealing, that's a whole other aspect, the whole media side of the cover-up and conspiracy. Let me catch myself there. See, I did it. I, I also caution researchers from using the word cover-up these days. But that's a whole other essay. Now, uh, yeah, so the, the conspiracy. So that's a whole other aspect of the conspiracy, the propaganda of the conspiracy, which I, I emphasize is the most successful part of the conspiracy, was its, is its propaganda. Uh, and that's all there in the book of the film. Now, if you, want, if you need help choosing a book, a first book to read after, because you'll find a lot of books where it's a huge bibliography in the book of the film, then go to Jim Marr's Crossfire, because the film is credited as being based on that. Then go to the other book, 
that it was based on, which is On the Trail of the Assassins by Jim Garrison. And uh, that will be a very good uh, first semester. Well, I would agree with that, and I don't think that JFK, the book of the film, really gets enough credit on these best JFK book lists that go around. And I started with Jim Mars, so that'll always have a place in my heart as well. But let's turn to your research, if we may. And maybe my favorite essay of yours was entitled The Gordian Knot. Now, it caused me to really think about some things that I had just assumed before, which I actually like very much. But it was fascinating. So first, let's explain, what is the tale of the Gordian Knot? Well, I don't have the essay in front of me. I've gone paperless since 1975. But from memory, and if you have it in front of you, you can throw in some details too. King Gordius, the legend goes, uh, was the father of um, King Midas. And um, he, uh, he came up with this little game. Um, you know, there are people who always want your power when you're the king. And um, I think the realm that he was king of was an actual place, Gordia or something like that, something similar to his name. And he, uh, of course, people who wanted the throne, this is sort of like the old uh, sword in the stone with the King Arthur legend. So there are similar legends around. But uh, he, what he did was he tied an elaborate knot uh, with strands of rope. And um, in one version of the legend, Alexander the Great, well, many people tried to untie the knot unsuccessfully. And they would, you know, stand in line to take it. Because the, the, the prize of the game of untying King Gordius's knot was that you would take over the, the kingdom. You would become the king. So people lined up and they tried over and over, just like with the sword and the stone and King Arthur. Eventually came along Alexander the Great. Instead of uh, attempting to untie it, he took out his sword and cut the knot. And in one version of the legend, he cut it with his sword. In another version of the legend, he uh, loosened the yoke. It was tied to a, an ox cart, a yoke to an ox cart. And um, he, he pulled the yoke out and the knot unraveled itself. And he became the king of that realm as well. And what we're going to do tonight is that we're going to untie or really slice through the Gordian knot of the JFK assassination research community with everyone out there. So let's move through the pertinent issues of the essay. Sure. Now you write about the good, the bad, and the ugly of assassination research goals. So what is the goal of assassination research and what should it be? Well, it's a pet peeve of mine. that it, It's still, and it's part of the propaganda that the goal of assassination research is to solve the case. And I saw several years ago uh, that that's very wrong-headed. And I was heavily influenced by um, Vince Salandria and Martin Schatz. Uh, I had, this was after I read um, History Will Not Absolve Us by Martin Schatz. Um, and he and Vince Salandria really developed this whole thesis of the false mystery. And of course, they're right. It was, it's a false mystery. There was never anything to solve. It was obvious from day one that it was a conspiracy. I knew that, having been a kid in Dallas and hearing the adults talking. In one of the footnotes of my Rambler, my lengthy book link Rambler essay, which will be in the book, I talk about how, how uh, the news staff at my radio station, my favorite radio station in Dallas growing up was KLIF 1190, top 40 pop music, rock and roll, owned by Gordon McClellan. You know, this is more small world stuff that I didn't even have room for in the essay, but I could probably develop that into a, a book. More small world stuff, KLIF, Gordon McClendon, who knew Jack Ruby, and Jack Ruby was at the studios that weekend, blah, blah, blah. There's a whole story about that. And But the new staff went to cover the uh, Dallas Cowboys versus the Green Bay Packers. It's an away game. And, of course, this is Sunday. You know, Oswald is not even dead yet. And they are... They decide to go through the crowd because this is a horrific weekend. 
Yes, the NFL decided to have their games. Yes, some high schools did play their games, especially in Texas. Uh, school was not out in Texas that day, or not in Dallas. No, school. Yeah, I can tell you from personal fact, school was not out that day. Uh, some students, you were allowed to get off with a note from your parents. Uh, the students who were down at Dealey Plaza, that's how they did it, uh, or otherwise off that day. But um, where were I? Okay, so the new staff is, um, they decide, well, we need to well, keep on this story as well. We're not just here to cover the Cowboy game. Let's talk to the crowd. Let's ask them what they think of it, uh, about all this. And to a person, uh, and it's in my footnote. Everyone tells them uh, they've got the wrong guy. Uh, they don't think they've got the guy that did it. Uh, there's more to this. Uh, and then, of course, <laughs> Oswald is shot. And now everybody, this is the first thought everybody has, let me tell you. Uh, and to this day, when people learn that aspect of it, um, they think that. You know, how, how, could, how could this have happened? And this, this was... This was probably, you know, there were polls being taken even that weekend, uh, official opinion polls. But this is sort of a, a straw poll that's being taken in the crowd of a football game. And, of course, it's showing what the other polls are showing, uh, that the majority thinks this is a conspiracy. Uh, and so there was never, it was never a, a mystery. Now, fast forward, everybody, the Warren Commission is underway, and uh, everybody has that optimism again, although, you know, you know, LBJ and, and especially those of us in Texas, we don't like LBJ, we don't trust LBJ, but he's appointed this commission and we're, we're good citizens and we're going to see this through, but we're reading the papers and a lot of weird stuff is showing up in the papers and you can go back now and you can look at those newspapers and you can see the most bizarre, the most mind-blowing factual things that are being reported in the papers about the conspiracy. And, of course, the Warren Commission uh, staff attorneys are reading all this, too, but they're reading it from a different perspective. Now, around the same time, so Thomas G. Buchanan, he writes what became the first book about the JFK assassination. It's called Who Killed Kennedy? And in the preface of that book, he, he, uh, he says that the text of what you're about to read was submitted to the president's commission uh, to investigate the assassination in, in March of, of this year. This is 1964. The book was published in May. It was there were uh, excerpts from it published in a French newspaper uh, as early as March, April. But the book was published in May, and uh, but. The, the manuscript of the book before it was published was submitted to the Warren Commission at the behest, at the request of staff, a staff attorney that, was, that Mr. Buchanan was in touch with. And so like with everything being reported in the newspapers, Buchanan has his take on what he's been reading in the newspapers, and he cites a lot of news stories. He does get things wrong. We, to this day, of course we get things wrong, I was just listening to some wrong stuff, and it's irritating. So, but, but every time you hear somebody's speech and you, at a convention, at a conference, and you hear, you hear these podcasts and you hear these old, even the old May Russell radio broadcasts, you know, nobody gets everything right. You know, even, even Einstein couldn't think of everything, you know. Others had to come up with quantum mechanics. So not everybody can think of everything, no matter how smart you are. And you get things wrong, and bias comes into it, and you have to know critical thinking, and you, know how, you, know how, how, you have to know how to recognize your own biases and prejudices. And um, that's hard. But thinking is hard. And good writing is good thinking, and that's why write, good writing is hard. So... Buchanan does get things wrong, and if you find a copy of the book, it's it's very rare. I, I luck into it because I still haunt the shelves at Half Price Books, and my mind is blown. I still have those synchronicity moments that I can tell over and over. They still happen to this day. And rather than buy a book on Amazon, what I do is I go and and just haunt the bookshelves at Half Price Books to to support the brick and mortar and all that. So. But he got a lot right, 
and he's the first to actually publish in a book form what everybody was thinking, and that's that this is obviously a conspiracy. And um, he talks very poignantly, both in the preface and in the uh, end of the book, about how we owe, you know, we owe Kennedy uh, justice in this. And uh, I quote some of that as well in, in my other essays. Um, and in, I end my small world essay, as a matter of fact, with a quote from the end of his book. But he, so here's the Warren Commission, and now they have his manuscript. Of course, they have a lot of stuff. My other essays, my, my essay on the Rambler, my essay on the ballistics, which is called The Gun That Didn't Smoke, which we'll get to later. I spend the first couple of pages talking, not trying to prove the conspiracy, because even before I had read Vince Salandria, I had already picked up on this, that, you know, this is a conspiracy. Why should I spend any time, take the reader's time, take my time, proving something that is so obvious? So I spend the first few pages in every major essay of mine showing you the conspiracy. I don't try to prove anything to you. I show you why it's a conspiracy. And then I move on to explain what I have found and added to our understanding of this conspiracy. And that's completely my mindset to this day, and that's the, the mindset of Gordian Knot, the essay Gordian Knot. The, the subtitle, by the way, of the Gordian Knot is Why 54 Years of Revelations Have Failed to Make a Difference. And so this is my mindset, that uh, it's, that it is a mystery to be solved is, a, is propaganda. And people have bought into this propaganda, and it's good. It's successful propaganda because we bought into it, too many of us. And, but some have broken out of this and are moving on. And um, so that's, uh, that's basically Gordian Knot. Well, the next major point that I want to ask you about is is the issue of conferences. Sure. Now, I actually first saw you speak at the 2016 JFK conference in Dallas, which I talk about quite often on the show. But in this essay, you question the value of these annual conferences and what they still can do. Do you not? Um, wrong. Okay. Uh, so I I gave this entire essay as a speech in in Washington D.C. recently, and um, during the Q and A. Uh, Jim Fetcher, and you know he 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 was uh, right to bring this up because I I can see where this could be taken wrong. It could be it's a little vague. I don't really um, spell it out in the essay itself. But he 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 told me that I shouldn't denigrate the conferences. Uh, he said that you know the conferences have brought us a long way. Blah blah blah. And so I focused on that statement uh, when it after after he had uh, further developed his uh, interests during that Q&A session. And uh, th those who have not heard your interview with Fetzer, uh, when they do, take any, take any um, two minutes out of that broadcast, out of that show, and that's the Q&A. <laughs> when, when, when they gave him the microphone, He's, maybe maybe it was five minutes. We, you know, I was very patient, uh, but he did say he did accuse me of denigrating the conferences, and so I jumped on that immediately. I said, "I'm not denigrating the conferences. The confer conferences have had the value, but I've seen the history starting with the mega conferences." Now I skipped over that part earlier in my personal history, but in 1991, I um, uh, I went to South by Southwest and. In those days, it was smaller, and much smaller. It was in you know one convention center or one hotel, and they um, the, they have a media portion of the conference before they get into the the music part. And this was in the days before the film festival part of it. Um, so they ha but they did have their media uh, panel, and in this one, you know, the buzz had already started about JFK and the film coming up. Uh, this was 1991, after all, in the spring in March, and so I went to this panel discussion, and it um, it was Earl Goals and um, Bob Hoffaker, who had covered the assassination as a reporter, Earl Goals of the Dallas Morning News, Dallas Times-Herald, 
maybe both. You know, they all they went back and forth in those days. Earl Golds, who I became friends with and was a colleague of mine early on in my research, and a peer. Uh, he peer reviewed a lot of my earliest uh, manuscripts, and things on the, all of this stuff that will be in the book. And he was on the panel, and um, I can't recall the third person. It's in the essay, or maybe maybe not in the, in that essay, but I have it some in my notes. And let me tell you this um, this conference. They had it in. They, you know how the ballroom they'll have a conference in a ballroom, maybe that seats 500. This was maybe half or a quarter of a ballroom, so there were seats for, easily seats for 200. But this became standing room only. People were lining the back walls in every seat, lining the back walls, and there was a crowd standing at the door uh, and outside the door. It overflowed during this uh, hour, hour and a half with a Q&A. And it came to the point where during the Q&A, everybody was so fascinated that nobody wanted to leave. And they, um, they finally had to kind of run everybody out because they needed the room for the next event. And a few of us went out the back way into the hallway where we continued talking to the panelists and amongst ourselves with a small group. And the Q&A continued there. And everybody else went on their way. And after we finished our little back hallway session, I went out to the main lobby and I saw the moderator, Joe Nick Petoskey, who's a, a personality, former um, Texas Monthly editor, uh, personality here in Austin, well-known here, a musicologist and uh, aficionado of the Austin music scene. And so I went up to Joe Nick and I said, now you saw what just happened in there, standing room only. Nobody wanted to leave. You guys at South by Southwest are in the conference business. What if you had a conference devoted to nothing but what that panel was talking about? And I immediately saw his eyes light up. I could see, I could hear the gears turning in his brain. And um, he just kind of nodded and said, okay, thanks. And I went on my way. A uh, couple of months later, I get this fancy mailing in the mail uh, announcing the Assassination Symposium on John F. Kennedy, or as it was known, uh, uh, the ASK Conference. And that was the first one that November of 1991. And of course, I went to that. And I went to the next three. There were four ASK conferences. I know how that changed hands from uh, South by Southwest. I talked to the people who made the decision to give it up at South by Southwest. Uh, they said that they were at a meeting, they were at a staff meeting, uh, they looked at their list of conferences and said to themselves, which one doesn't belong? Because the rest were music conferences. That was their thing. And they looked and they said, which one doesn't belong? And so they decided to give the JFK conference to Mary Farrell, who was, of course, the legendary researcher in Dallas. And uh, it made, it was logical, it made sense. And then, but she was elderly at the time. She ran the first one. But anyway, so I could get into a lot of detail here that would get sidetracked. But let me just tell you, I have seen the transitions. I saw the transition from South by Southwest. I saw to Lancer. The Lancer Conference continues somewhat to this day. There was talk of disbanding that. Uh, but it's still, there's still a Lancer Conference in Dallas. COPA. Uh, the, the Coalition on Political Assassinations, actually, the inception of COPA, and I have not written about this, but I'll, I'll do a little exclusive for you here. My, my group of colleagues at the Center for Deep Political Research know this story. Uh, but I, don't, I haven't really talked about it publicly. But it was at that, um, the third, the 1993 ASK conference. It was all over. Everybody was checking out on Sunday. And there was a group of researchers, some names you'll know, Gary Aguilar, uh, Jim Eugenio, Bill Kelly. Yeah, there's a whole list. There were about 20, 25 people, a couple of dozen people standing around the lobby. And we were a little anxious at this idea because we'd already heard, I don't know if it had been announced at this point or if it was just the buzz that Mary Farrell was going to hand the uh, 
hand the conference keys over to a group going by the name of JFK Lancer. And we knew we knew about Lancer. I had interacted with the people at Lancer before they were Lancer, uh, when they were just a little um, bookseller in Irving, Texas. And they sold my first manuscripts of the research that I was doing. Mail order. Everything was mail order in those days. And, you know, they would hand out their flyers at the conventions, and people would mail order from those. Uh, and so I was interacting with them uh, pretty closely. And so we knew who they were, and we were distressed, you know, uh, that they were going to hold these conferences. You know, everybody, Mary Farrell was so huge and so respected that, you know, that was not so much a problem. But uh, to give it to some newcomer, some unknown, that was a problem. And so John Judge, of course, how could I leave his name out? He was the guy running the whole little meeting. It was an impromptu meeting, a couple dozen people. I was there. And we said, okay, why don't we start our own conference? And uh, just, uh, you know, and then we'll see how things go. And so a year later, 1994, June, we all convened in Washington, D.C. at a hotel. And we had the organizational meeting for COPA. We called it COPA, Citizens on Political Assassination, which basically became pretty much all John Judge. You know how a church will become all about the one preacher? You know, there were, uh, I still have the list of the founders who were there. We, we, we created a little mailing list, and John made sure we all got a copy. In those days, we didn't have cell phones. Uh, and call lists on our cell phones. So we, we made up directories. And there were some pretty fancy there. Um, there was a guy in Florida, Gordon Winslow, who who was the guy who published a major telephone book. This was a major directory of every known researcher, major and minor. And I was in that as well. And that's how we stayed in touch with each other, by phone and and by, by snail mail. And so that directory... Uh, I recently photographed it and showed it to our CDPR uh, board. I would say there's maybe, mm, you know, maybe those 20 names, 20, 24 names on there. Some of, some of whom you don't even recognize today. Some you, that I still recognize, but um, newer people don't, and um, who are still around, but very low-key, very behind the scenes. I'm still in touch with some of them. And so that's how Copa got started. So, but now, you know, John Judge died, you know, and uh, he requested that Copa be disbanded because he was already well on his way to forming the Hidden History Museum. And that was the focus of his, uh, his, you know, ambitions. And he was married, and, but when he died, his wife took over and um, saw to it that his wishes were kept. And now we have the Hidden History Museum and History, Hidden History Center. And we disbanded COPA at, at his request. And then a group of COPA members then formed another group. Anyway, long story short, we're in the post, the post COPA, and I also call it the post mega conference. What I've been describing, this whole history from the 90s to the early 2000s, is I call it the mega conferences. Uh, it was ASK that turned. Now there had been conferences before before this, and I want to credit uh, Jerry Rose, who published a little newsletter called the Third Decade, and then after ten years it became the Fourth Decade. That's where I first started getting published with my essays. So he was on the Grand Holding conferences before then. My very first manuscript on the Rambler getaway car, I presented it at a scholarly conference which was called the, the Fourth Conference of the Third Decade or something like that, 1993. This was June of 1993, or March of 1993. And I presented it as a scholarly paper. It was peer-reviewed. Uh, you had a peer reviewer at the conference who was responsible for critiquing your paper. So you would give your presentation, and then your peer reviewer would give his presentation about the paper. And I came, I came out good. I came out pretty good. And then um, turned it into, I, I expanded a little further, turned it into a manuscript, started selling it through Andy Winniarzik at Last Hurrah Bookshop. 
Prevailing Winds Press in California, uh, Patrick Formey, for those old-timers who know the milieu from back then, and with Deborah Conway at JFK Lancer, or JFK Chronicles. And she started publishing some of my stuff in uh, Assassination Chronicles. And so, just to let you know that I was, I, I am knowledgeable, I was in touch with everybody. My first researcher, you know, usually, you know, a lot of people, their first researcher will be some some lesser person. But my first researcher that I actually made contact with was a phone call to David Lifton. And of course he was he was good, he was gracious. He can be he can be difficult, as those who know him well know. But he was nice to me because I had an in and that's that gave me the courage to contact him because I actually went to LA to attend a wedding. My wife had a sorority sister in college who had gone on to Pepperdine University. And while she was in school in LA, she she actually dated David Lifton. I don't know how they met or whatever, but she dated David Lifton. And I learned this through my wife. She tells me this. And I'm like, my jaw drops when I hear this. And Want to go to the wedding? Oh, sure. You know? And so I start plotting my, my contact with David. And of course, Lifton's in the phone book. And this is not, this is, um, what is this? This is 1990. This is, uh, yeah, 1990. And I'm nervous, of course, but he's in the phone book. And so I just, from the hotel, I give him a call. I said, I introduced myself. I told him why I was there. I, oh, how's she doing? And I'm glad to hear she's getting married. And uh, shared some small talk about that. And he mentions, you know, what he's doing now. I won't get into some of that, but... Uh, it's interesting, and so, but we we strike up a uh, a friendship. He wants to hear. He sort of is a little exasperated, but since I have an in, he actually tolerates me telling what my my research is about, and he was very gracious and friendly. So, but anyway, so I've I've been there, and I saw the the history of the mega conferences, and I came, I finally came out of it all in the post conference period, post mega conference period. Uh, I started going, I stopped going to those conferences because, you know, I've been to so many of them. I spoke at the 1997 COPA conference. Um, that's somewhere out there on film, on video. And I was talking about, that was the only time I had ever been invited anywhere to talk about my Rambler getaway car research. And so thanks to John Judge posthumously for that. But then I, I started, had this uneasy feeling, you know, that, you know, it was repetition. You know, once you knew all this stuff, what was the point? And I would still go, and I would hang out. I would go to Dealey Plaza at the anniversaries, and I would meet up with people attending the conferences. I would hear all the gossip. Then along came, along comes the internet. Along comes uh, social media, and of course, now you have an ongoing conference. What we, what we waited for the conferences to do back then. We do every day now with social media that, you know, those backroom discussions, those hotel room discussions that we would have, those lunch and dinner discussions that we would have, those go on all the time now. The forums, what started out as email list servers, the early chat groups, uh, that's where those started. And they, they evolved as social media evolved. You can watch that evolution. The JFK research community followed all of those steps in that evolution. And I, I saw it for what it was. It was it was a 24-7, 365 conference that was happening digitally. And it, that goes on to this day. And I was busy with other stuff, you know, trying to get back to my art career. And I'd done my major research. Didn't want to repeat myself. And uh, I just I kept tabs on anything but indirectly. And then, but, um, then 2014 comes along and I get invited to the JFK Historical Group Conference in Washington, D.C. And now it's the 20th anniversary of when I was there to help found COPA. So there's some nostalgia there. And I'm, but I'm also curious now because the mega conferences had ended and the remnants were smaller. Uh, COPA was no more. 
And I wanted to get a feel for what was happening uh, with these new, the new versions of these conferences. There was the Judith Baker Conference, uh, Chris Milligan, the, the Trine Day Conference. Nobody really knows what to call it still. Judith Baker Conference is as good as anything, but it really isn't. You know, it really isn't Trine Day. What it is, I'll, I'll tell you, I don't know if I mentioned this specifically, this terminology specifically in the essay, but I can be very critical of it. I, you know, I, in fact, I don't mention this because I would have remembered, you know, Fetcher wouldn't have let me get away with it at, at, during that Q&A. But these, and, you know, and to some extent, so was that DC conference because you have the speakers' tables, you have and well, of course, in the mega conferences, you had the dealer room, but you have that at, at even at scholarly scientific conferences. Uh, you have, you know, people are selling their books. I go to con cartooning conferences, the Association of American Editorial Cartoonists, uh, and you know, in a much smaller way, they have their book sales, and, and you know, and even like Comic Con, uh, you have it. But at Comic Con, it really is more the sale of everything. It is marketing of these things more than it is the presenters and the celebrities. But to a large extent, these conferences, the mega conferences, became what I call big tent revivals within the bubble of assassination research. And they also became celebrity slash book festivals, sort of like comic cons, but not conspiracy cons, you know. But it, I suppose it's a national, natural progression if, if you don't stick to the academic and scholarly approach. So now I think of it in these terms. There is, there is conflict. And there were, from the, that moment, when I was right in the middle of it, that impromptu meeting where COPA got started, there's conflict. But Looking at the big picture now, I see the conflict as this more than it is. There's the personality conflicts, yes. But it's really between the academic scholarly conference approach that Jerry Rose had going and others did, and then the celebrity slash book festival theme that really began with South by Southwest because, of course, that was their thing. They put on a music conference, which is a big pop culture celebrity. It's music con instead of comic con. And then, of course, comic con grew up out of the old Star Trek conventions. And I had even been to a few of those in the early 70s. So, you know, I saw what was happening. I saw the evolution and I witnessed it. So now I say, you know, they have, and in, in the essay and in the speech, I said, they have outlived their usefulness. And by usefulness, it gets into another thing that we're going to touch on in this section about, you know, the future of JFK research. The, uh, and, and it goes back to what we had touched on earlier about, you know, uh, what is the purpose of JFK research? And if it's not to solve the case, if the case is already solved, what is the purpose of research? Well, I say it's to resolve, not solve, but resolve. I quote, uh, John Judge in the essay where he said in the, the movie The Searchers, Randy Benson's fantastic greatest documentary ever done on on us and what we do, and you've had him on your show talking about his great film, but he, he, he put this great quote from John Judge in there where John said, and he said it at Daly Plaza during the moment of silence, uh, during the speech after the moment of silence, he said, if you want a if you want a democracy, you have to solve the Kennedy assassination. Applause, cheers. True enough, uh, but he he was well aware of Vince Salandria's false mystery by then, and Martin Schatz. And but still, we still have those slips of the tongue, like I did earlier when I said cover up. It's hard because those neurological paths, those dendrites, have been created in our brains by the propaganda. And we tend to follow them by habit. Habit is a major thing. Relevance is a major thing. So that's how propaganda works. That's why it's successful. But some of us, some of us are not authoritarian. Some of us are anti-authoritarian from day one. It's part of our nature. And we have the best chance of breaking out of this. I'm one of those. And so I say the purpose is to resolve the Kennedy. Assignment. If you want a democracy, 
you have to resolve the Kennedy assassination. Now, resolving it gets into something I call the end game, which you wanted to discuss as well. But I think that pretty much covers what I'm saying in that essay about the conference. I'm not denigrating them, and they will go on. And they must go on. Let me put it this way. The conferences must go on. But I am in the school, <laughs> no pun intended, of the academic scholarly approach, solidly, not the celebrity book festival approach. Because I think the celebrity book festival approach is a death knell, a death sentence for us. There are already are denigrators out there who, who call it conspiracy porn. And, you know, they're not completely wrong about that. I don't know where you wanted to go next, but I wanted to insert something here that relates to this. Uh, I've written about this, and I chose not to put it in this essay, which was already getting long, and then I thank David Denton at the JFK Historical Group for giving me an, an hour, a couple hours to speak, get it all out there, and have a Q&A. But still, you have to you have to edit things out eventually. And I, what I edited out was this, and I've told other researchers this in social media privately. There are four, I see four types. I know the research community. I've interacted with it. I know it. I see, I, I break it into four groups. The real researchers who are doing the real work, the real scholarly work, writing the essays, writing the books, the journals, which are not, now not so much journals as they are blogs, but the excellent ones like Jim DiEugenio's Kennedys and King, Joe Green's dissenting views, where you will see some of my, my essay on uh, the election, which we haven't gotten to yet. But, okay, so you have the real researchers doing the actual work. They're a tiny minority, because they're doing really hard work, and they're doing it in a scholarly way with all the hurdles and all the challenges that come with it. And then you have, I'll start at the bottom, you have what I call the armchair researchers. They are, I also call them the thrill seekers. They're not doing any research. They're the fans of the research. They are the actual buffs. And believe me, I have interacted with plenty of those. And I, I don't, uh, I don't tolerate them very easily or very often. I don't have a lot of patience for them anymore. You evolve through that as well. Early on, you do spend hours and hours with them. Then you learn to recognize them very quickly because they can really talk the details, and they are into the details, but only for the purpose of getting the adrenaline rush of the mind-blowing new Thing, the new news. What's the news? What did you hear? What's the rumor? What? Oh my God, that you know blows my mind. OMG! After after they get their mind blown with the next new fact and the next new book, they're satisfied. They have had their adrenaline rush. Then it wears off, and they're off seeking the next the next adrenaline rush. And because of them, there is some truth to the to the term conspiracy porn because they're not doing anything else. And you see them on the forums. And that's one, another reason I got out of the forums. It's just you learn to choose your battles. You learn to consolidate your time. Your time is so limited anyway because we have our lives, our, our jobs. We're making a living in this economy, you know, this cartoon curse word economy. And it's hard. It's very hard to find the time to even read um, or reread any books. Uh, and, you know, the social media itself. There's great stuff. You can really keep up with fantastic stuff. You know, I feel, we feel, though, we, the, the real researchers feel like Einstein in 1904, before his miracle year, where he's a clerk in a patent office. And the only way he, he can keep up with physics, and he has all the anxiety that we feel with this research. Uh, he knows physics. He's Einstein. But he has this anxiety that, you know, he has to do his job. He has to do his patent clerk stuff. And his, his boss is looking over his shoulder anyway and, you know, trying to keep him in line, keep him doing his job and reading these plans and things. And he needs this job because he does, it doesn't pay much. And 
Now he he hopes to get into a university someday, and he hopes to you know do actual physics. And he he tries to keep up as much as possible. He with letters from friends and with whatever publications are coming out, he can get his hands on, just like we're doing. And he takes little notes. He keeps little notes, and he tucks them in the drawer, his desk drawer at work. And on his breaks, he, he brings those out and looks at them. And, but he's still very frustrated because he can't keep up. He feels like he's not keeping up with physics. And then, you know, a year later, he has his, his miracle year, talking to his friend uh, and gets the idea for relativity. And he's off and running after that. But, you know, it didn't have to happen that way. He, he might not have had that revelation at that time. And we're all in that 1904 Einstein mode where we're, where we're frustrated and we're, there's too much to do. We'll, we'll get into that more too when we talk about the think tank. But, well, but, let me um, ask you this first. Now, I want to ask you about the last category that you described and then we can get to the other two. Now, the last category that you described, the conspiracy buffs, you can make the argument, and some listening right now probably are, that if the category of interested citizens are not buying the tickets to the conferences and not buying the books, then many of these author researchers can't do what they do full time, and many may not even be able to do this part time. When that happens, this becomes a hobby rather than a profession or a calling. And because the author then would have to have a profession, and the time that can be spent on the calling really dissipates, where do they go from there? And in music terms, these are the people buying the albums and the concert tickets, right? Sure, yeah. And without them, how long into real adulthood can the band or artist even exist as a band or an artist? Now, the argument can then be made that someone such as yourself sees these conferences through the eyes of a researcher or a speaker, which is completely valid. But the attendees of these conferences, the people who go every year, they might not have people in their daily lives who are interested or who care about you know, the JFK assassination or, or RF. K. Jr.'s new book, or The Deep State, or any of this. So for them, these three days in Dallas are re-energizing, and this group uses those three days, those conferences, to really reignite the fire, so to speak. Yeah, uh, you're absolutely right. Um, several points I want to make about that. And I do want to get to the other two, which relate to what you're saying, the other two categories. The, like I said, the conferences are not going to go away. Not even the celebrity book festival conferences are going to go away. They're here to stay, whoever wants to do that. And yes, even in the days of the ASK, very first ASK conference, I mean, you know, 500 people, they had a full ballroom, packed, 500 people. Uh, today, you're, you know, my, my uh, speeches in Dallas, when they are full, that's 200 people. They have to add extra seats to get 200 in, the, in those rooms. Uh, you were at one of those. And, but you know, imagine the full ballroom of 500 people, and the stage is way far ahead of you, and it's massive. That was ASK 1991. It was amazing. And, of course, you know, a tiny minority of those are the actual researchers, and many of those are up there on the podium doing these presentations. And then another handful are out in the audience. The rest are, you know, either this category or the other two categories. Uh, and you're right. Now, here's the way I'll resolve this. I have a book coming out, and, and I have said that the books aren't working either. And the reason I'm saying all this, by the way, is because we're 25 years into this now. Since the mega conferences, we're 25 years in, and nothing has changed. 54 years of revelations, and nothing has changed. And if you've been to those conferences, and you've heard those speakers, and you've had your mind blown, and you've done the research, and you see what the reality is, and then, you look, then you're inside the bubble, and everything's great. And, and that it is great. You're right. They're, they're good to go to, and they have a usefulness. But in terms of resolving the assassination, and and getting justice for Kennedy. They have outlived their, their usefulness. Uh, they, they have to go on because the research has to be done. But imagine this, and, and I've done this thought experiment. After we resolve the assassination, and I do, and this gets into endgame, I do want to get back to the other two categories. But let me just introduce this at this point to get your mind starting to think. I want people to imagine a world that when you leave the conference, 
it's the same world as you were in inside the bubble. Right, yes. Now, start there. Start with that vision of success where everybody knows this stuff and everybody, all they argue about is the details. They don't argue whether it's a conspiracy or not. And after that, you just, your mind takes off into, well, what would, what would it be like? What, what would government be like? What would politics have to be like? What would law enforcement have to be like? What would we have to do if this was accepted? And I use that word uh, more than I use resolve or resolution. The end game is basically about forcing acceptance of the conspiracy. Everybody knows it was a conspiracy. I, I posted this on Facebook not too long ago, uh, and I forget where the, who said the quote. It's a, a Russian artist painter who said it originally. But she said, the rules are simple. They lie to us. We know they're lying. They know we know they're lying. But they keep lying, and we keep pretending to believe them. That's the quote. And those are the rules. Those are the rules. And so the only way to stop this, we have to get out of that vicious cycle. The only way to stop it is to force acceptance. Uh, force the lies to stop. Every day, we, I call it a slap in the face. Every day that you know, I read some, some new fact about the Kennedy assassination, or some old fact about the Kennedy assassination, but even when it becomes news like it has during these new fall releases, um, I'm going, you know, why isn't this a doomsday headline in the New York Times, in the L.A. Times, in the Washington Post? Well, of course, I know why it isn't, but it should be. And every day it's not, it's a slap in the face. And every day a newscaster scoffs at the idea of a conspiracy that killed JFK. It's another slap in the face. And all the little slaps in the face, like, like uh, the pseudo-mainstream books on the assassination that have been written in recent years even. Uh, they're doubling down on uh, the propaganda. You know, it, I saw this well before the file releases, and I knew what was going to happen, because I saw, I saw that they were not so stupid as to double down on the lone assassin thesis when you know, it was all going to be over with the file releases. So I knew the files were not going to be released before the, well, well before the first release. Uh, before anybody was even thinking about the first release, because I knew the deadline from way back. And that gets into my other essay about the realities of the 2016 election. But um, anyway, so back to the other two categories. So we have the real researchers, we have the thrill seekers, and then we have the misinformation, mis misinformationists. The ones who are into all the minutia, the details, all, you know, the... Uh, they're the ones who argue the ballistics. Where were the shooters? How many shooters? What were the trajectories? Uh, and then you pick any aspect. Doorman. Oswald wasn't on the sixth floor. He was, he was at, standing on the front steps. Yeah, and, and they're right. The facts are there. The minutia is there. And the minutia is valuable because, of course, the devil is in the details. But if all you do is rehash the details, and that's all they do, them. The, the misinformation was. I say that because even though they, they deal with actual facts, they also, you know, trip over a lot of the facts that have been inserted that are not true. And they argue this at length, ad infinitum, on the forums and at the conferences. And, and then the, third, the uh, uh, fourth category, the disinformationists. And of course, all these categories do overlap as well, but I've, I've defined them in these start terms. The fourth category is the disinformationalists, and they are the actual paid propagandists who insert themselves, infiltrate into the research community, into the bubble, and make sure that everything stays confused and that there's a counter-argument to every argument. That's their job. We all know <laughs> the names of some of them. Some of them are well-known, some of them are not so well-known, some of them are so hidden, and uh, so there, there's the four categories. 
Well, now that we've defined the categories of those in this community, I'm wondering where we go from here, Richard. Now, we're closing in on 55 years since November 22nd, 1963. So what should be the end game in this field? Okay, well, along with my post-megaconference thinking uh, and staying away from the, the online forums and seeing all the infighting and seeing all of these categories overlap and go at each other, I started uh, trying to innovate, you know. I, I, that's what I do. I, I, I was raised as a creative artist. Uh, I know how to nurture creativity. I have a creative brain, a visual brain. And so I just tend to go in that direction. You know, I, you present me with a problem. I look at the leading theories, and I, I, I've always had a knack that I discovered in the eighth grade of looking at the leading scientific theories and picking the right one. It started out with plate tectonics, which if you're, to younger remember this, it may astound you that in 1968, plate tectonics was a crazy, wacko theory that hardly anybody believed. <laughs> and all I did was look up at the world map on the wall in the classroom, and I said, well, of course it's plate tectonics. And, of course, I applied that thinking to other, because if I had a hobby, it would be science. Uh, I, I want to correct you on that, too. Uh, I don't see this as a hobby. And when you brought that up, when you gave me a preview of where we were going to go with this interview, I started thinking, you know, okay, it's, I've never saw it, seen it as a hobby uh, because we have to do it. It's activism in a sense. It's a def it defines us as people. I think a lot of people who are as into it as I am and have pursued it uh, with, the, with the, the grit and the resolve that I have, I've discovered that they all, if you start talking to them, you find out they all have a personal connection to this there's some family and i have my family connections but then when i when i first i discover that you are really dedicated to this and i know that mindset so i will see that quickly when i discover that i start asking you you know when did you get started in this you know what's your story and every time it will come down to a family member was involved in some way or somebody saw something heard something it's more than just reading it's more than just uh, knowing the story indirectly. They have a direct personal connection to it, as I do. And so that's where that resolve comes from. Yes, exactly. And what I'd said in an earlier email was that I think that, that a discussion of your background, because it's intensely personal, will really dissuade those who think this conspiracy research is a hobby. And I know that this work is not a hobby. I know how personal it is. I have my own very personal story of how I became active in this. Right, right. However... It seems that many people out there who are not really into researching these stories, and sadly that's the vast majority of people out there, they all view this as, as a nerdy little hobby practiced by the crazy uncle or crazy aunt in the family. And that's just not true at all. Right, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's you know, part of the marginalization, part of the propaganda. Uh, we have to be denigrated, we have to be marginalized. Uh, that's all, that's going to be out there. But, you know, that aside, if it's not a hobby, what is it? For those for those of us to whom it is not a hobby, what is it? Is it an avocation? Well, we're not making any money at it. In fact, we're losing money. Uh, you'll have those exceptions when David Lifton made uh, a pretty good amount off of his bestseller. Occasionally, there's a good seller. There are no more bestsellers. That may change. We're expecting David Lifton's new book out this year. We're expecting H.P. Alborelli's new book about the JFK assassination out this year. Uh, the buzz is from people that I listen to and respect, like Alan Kemp, the buzz is that those books are going to make a difference. Now, I'm skeptical because of what I've been saying here all along. But I keep an open mind. I, it could happen. I know it can happen. But after, um, for me, after a lifetime of waiting, and I'm talking about the waiting for the Warren Commission, the waiting for Garrison's uh, trial, the waiting for uh, the House Select Committee. The wait, it's all been waiting, and then all things sort of like just die out afterward. Uh, you think, and then Watergate happens, you think, okay, here we go, this is going to, it's all going to break open then. And then the books that came after that, connecting Watergate to the assassination, okay. But no, 54 years, coming up on 55 years, nothing changes. It all gets 
buried. It all gets set aside. And so I started thinking, well, and, and also at the same time I'm learning, okay, so where do the lies come from? Uh, we have to stop the lies. We have to force acceptance of the truth. Everybody knows the truth. They just don't accept it. Uh, we pretend to believe them, as the quote said. Um, so how do we stop pretending? Where do the where are the lies come? Uh, so I say let's let's follow the trail. Let's follow, and part of it is following the money. But where's the money? And uh, where's the money behind the lies? I found out. It's in the think tanks. And Jonathan Marshall wrote an essay about this, and he said, and I quoted that essay. Jonathan Marshall said that the major, I'm paraphrasing, but the major source of the propaganda, the anti-democratic propaganda, is the think tanks. And then you look a little further into it, and you discover uh, a memo written by Supreme Court Justice Lewis Powell in 1971 called the Powell Memo. Just Google that, the Powell Memo. And you'll see that he outlined this idea of now, think tanks had already been around. They really got going after World War II. But he came up with this idea that we could create right-wing conservative think tanks for our political mindset that will push, start pushing everything to the right. And we will, we will come up with the research. We will come up with the talking points. And we will get that out to the media. We will, and we will brainstorm. And we will come up with the ways to turn what they call the left-wing media the liberal media, will turn it around to us. And so people took this memo seriously, and well, let me backtrack a, a little bit of a, a side note here. Uh, in, when I was at community college, I formed a um, Young Republicans Club at my community college, at Richland Community College. Those of you who are out there hearing this, you know Richland, who are students there now, who are professors there now. I'm the one who founded the Young Republicans Club there. Uh, on, on the other hand, I did help. I was a co-founder of the Science Fiction Club. I don't know if that's still there, but, you know, there's that too. Anyway, uh, I founded the Young Republicans Club because I was requested to by a more conservative high school friend who, who had uh, called me and said, would you do this? And um, I said... So I was taking my first in-depth history classes in college, and I was actually in the middle of doing a research paper about Nelson Rockefeller and about the, what would happen if he actually became president. He was vice president under Ford. And um, I began to see in that essay that, you know, that would not be a good thing. <laughs> Yet, this was immediately post-Watergate. This is 1975. And I'm thinking as part of my thinking in history class, well, you know, let's do this from the inside. You know, the, the Republican Party seems to have completely collapsed and has been disgraced because of Watergate and Gerald Ford pardoning Nixon. So what if I was to go in at this point into the ashes and help rebuild it from the inside? So I founded my little club, got some members. We went to the regional convention in Waco, and there... I saw people running the show. First of all, I'm interacting with other Republicans who are very political Republicans. At this point, I'm not political. This is my first experience in politics. And I'm uncomfortable. I'm just uncomfortable around all of these conservatives and these right-wingers. And then on the stage, you've got guys from the national organization like Lee Atwater and Karl Rove. And they were like close to my age. They were just only slightly older. And they're running things. And there is bigger jerks then as they became later. And, and I leave that regional conference in Waco and I go back and I say, you know, I can't, I can't do this. <laughs> I don't like hanging around with these people. Uh, this is not me. So I got out of that and put all my efforts into my science fiction club. <laughs> and my politics evolved from there. And uh, I started hanging around with Democrats and I thought, hey, they're more fun to hang out with. You know, I've, my evolution in terms of what I am politically uh, is that, you know, I am not a, not a party person. I think parties are the problem. They've become a huge problem. Thomas Jefferson saw them. He warned against having them at all. But they, 
they grow out of factionalism, and we all know about factionalism. You're going to have factions anyway, and those some of those factions get organized. And so I don't know that there was any way to not have them. You know, nice try with Jefferson warning against them. But I see the bigger picture with parties, and I see how they, they switch loyalties back and forth. You know, whatever's going to get them the votes, they switch back and forth. And you definitely have seen that in Texas. In Texas, a Democrat was traditionally a post-war Reconstructionist uh, conservative right-winger. And that evolved after FDR and, and uh, the changing ways of getting votes. You know, there's a whole history to it. You can, you can read up on that. But, so I avoid defining myself. I avoid identity politics and defining myself in terms of a party. And it allows me some objectivity. And, of course, um, our think tank is nonpartisan because, of course, we're going to have to go after people pretty much in every party. And uh, certainly the major parties. I mean, you have Nixon on one hand and you have Lyndon Johnson on the other hand. Uh, and then you've got Kennedy. Uh, so it's, all, it's a mishmash. And you know why that's part of the propaganda. It's part of the wedge-ism, splitting us against each other. You know, it, it's, that's a whole different topic. That's a whole other show. Yes, yes it is. And as someone who's been a third-party voter since 1996, I understand completely the feeling of not belonging, which, to be honest, I now wear like a badge of honor. But regarding the Gordian knot, in one section you even mentioned the possibility of exhuming John Kennedy's body? Yeah, and, you know, I had just mentioned that as part of um, part of the vision I see post-acceptance, post-justice. But I had to um, flesh it out a little because... Uh, Charles Drago, those of you who know the research community, Charles Drago, uh, I asked him to read a preview of that essay. And uh, and I let a lot of people read previews of it, uh, but he was the only one who, and I knew he would, and that's why I let him read it, because I knew he would critique it honestly. And it, coming from a mindset of his that I knew, well, because he came out of the whole George Michael Evica, uh, Martin Schatz, and Salandria school, and I knew he would get a lot of what I was saying, and I knew he would see any flaws. And he did. And he took offense to the idea of exhumation. And that forced me to see that, you know, it is a little, people may see it as morbid. And so I had to clarify that in the speech. And I said that it's, uh, once you get over the shock of it, uh, you see that it has it, something that is not something that will be done, that will not be demanded in advance. Because I've already seen that. After John Connolly died, there was a call from the uh, Assassination Archives Research Center and various law groups within the community to remove the um, bullet fragments from John Connolly's wrist and thigh um, because they would tell us a lot about the forensics of the ballistics. And, of course, that was just completely pounced on immediately by the media. How dare you? How morbid? You now, look at these conspiracy nuts and what they're saying. So, yeah, it's not something you propose as a first step. What I'm saying is it's something that will have to happen. Once acceptance is there, I want you to envision, I want you to start thinking in terms of the, the way things would be in a post-acceptance world. Uh, of course, an exclamation has to happen because you have to get to the bottom of what happened to Kennedy. You have to have an honest autopsy, and that can even be done. You know, we know that... Um, Frank Olson was exhumed, the, the famous guy who was experimented on H.P. Alborelli's book, A Terrible Mistake, about MK Ultra LSD drug experiments on unknowing innocent civilians. Uh, Frank Olson was one of those, and he uh, was thrown or, or jumped out a window while under the influence of these drug experiments, unbeknownst to him. And years and years later, decades later, his son, his son uh, had his body exhumed, and and then I'd also point out that other presidents have been exhumed. Abraham Lincoln was exhumed four times, one time to just make sure that he was in his coffin. Uh, and then, of course, in more recent years, uh, Zachary Taylor was exhumed for actually for the first purpose of a forensic examination to determine exactly how he died. It was thought that he was poisoned, and of course, there may have been a little funny business with that autopsy as well because they determined there 
There wasn't enough arsenic in his system to justify a murder. Um, but who knows, though? So I say we should leave and look at that again. But in a post-acceptance world of the JFK assassination truth, when everybody stops pretending to believe the lies, we have to do something. We have to, we have to act as adults. We have to seek post-acceptance justice to resolve this. And that means we have to know the full extent of the criminality of the criminal autopsy. And we know it was a criminal autopsy. We know the strangeness of the destroyed first draft of the autopsis notes and, the, and all of that. You can dig, dig into it. When you put on your misinformationist and disinformationist hat <laughs> and wade through all that, you can. the devil is in the details there as well. And this has been Richard Bartholomew, the co-founder of the Center for Deep Political Research, which can be found at cdpresearch.org. That's cdpresearch.org. Now, at this point, Richard and I decided to continue talking into the evening, but because of length, I made the choice to divide our two conversations into three episodes. And with that said, we'll be right back with some exciting news. Hi, this is Joseph Green from JoeGreenJFK.com and the author of An Intro to the JFK Assassination Conspiracy. For more on the JFK assassination, download episode 28 of the Midnight Rider News Show. Now, multiple times in this episode, you heard Richard Bartholomew refer to his upcoming book. And I have the pleasure to announce now that its release date will be July 4th. And the title, The Deep State in the Heart of Texas. Fan. Fantastic. So we urge everyone out there to go to MidnightRiderNews.com for more information. We'll post it as we have it. I am looking forward to it, and I'm sure you are too. So also look for the other two Richard Bartholomew episodes on Midnight Rider News, and both should be released by the end of June. You don't want to miss those, believe me. So from the other side of the mountain, on the best side of midnight, I wish you peace. You can contact St. Patrick by email at midnightridernews at gmail.com. Join us on Facebook at Midnight Rider News Show. Follow St. Patrick on Twitter at MWN underscore St. Patrick. We are LinkedIn at S period T period Patrick. And don't forget to follow Midnight Rider News on your YouTube, iTunes, Stitcher Radio, and many of your favorite podcast providers. This has been a production of MidnightRiderNews.com and St. Patrick. Copyright 2018. All rights reserved. We'll see you next time, and be good to the night.